Caching is like keeping a shortcut to frequently traveled paths. It saves time and resources. In the world of APIs, caching can dramatically improve performance and scalability by reducing the load on databases and servers. But how do we implement caching effectively in REST APIs? Let's go step by step, starting with the basics. The application layer is where most caching happens in REST APIs. By caching frequently accessed data, we can cut down on redundant database queries and computations, making our API much faster. In-memory caching is a great first step. Tools like Redis and Memcached are popular choices. They store data in memory, making retrieval almost instantaneous. And here is a simple Java example where we are using Redis, an in-memory data store, to cache user profiles and minimize database hits. Here, the Redis client.get user ID retrieves the profile from Redis using the user ID as the key. If the data exists, it's a cache hit, and the profile is returned instantly. No need to query the database. If the data isn't found in Redis, it's a cache miss. In this case, the application fetches the profile from the database. This is the fallback mechanism. The database query ensures that the user still gets the correct data even when the cache is empty. Once the data is retrieved from the database, we cache it in Redis for future request. Here, the setX method stores the profile in Redis with a time to live or TTL of 300 seconds or five minutes. This means the data will automatically expire after five minutes, ensuring the cache doesn't hold outdated information. Now, think about the next request for the same user profile. Instead of hitting the database again, the application fetches it directly from Redis in milliseconds. This reduces latency, minimizes load on your database, and improves the overall user experience. By using Redis as a caching layer in your REST API, you can handle higher traffic, reduce response times, and lower the load on your database. It's a simple yet powerful technique to make your application scalable and efficient. Application layer caching happens deeper within the application logic, often focusing on specific data or computation results rather than entire responses. Request level caching is all about caching entire API responses for specific requests. It's tied to individual API calls and is typically implemented based on unique request parameters, for example, query strings or request headers. This approach is especially useful for read-heavy operations like GET request, where the data doesn't change frequently. And here is the basic workflow. When a client makes a GET request, the server first checks if a cache response exists. If it does, then it's a cache hit. The server immediately returns the cache data. If it doesn't, it's a cache miss. The server processes the request, generates the response, and caches it for future use. Request-level caching relies on generating unique cache keys for each combination of request parameters. A cache key is a unique identifier used to store and retrieve cache data. It represents a specific request for dataset and ensures that cache responses are correctly associated with the corresponding request. This ensures that responses for different queries don't overwrite each other. For example, consider an API that fetches paginated user list. So let's say you have an API to fetch user details. Here you can use the user ID as a key. This ensures that the cache response is tied specifically to user 123. A request for user 456 would use a different key, say user underscore 456. Or you can consider an API that returns a paginated list of users. Here, use a combination of the query parameters to create the key. For example, consider an API method that fetches paginated user list. Here, we first generate a unique key user list underscore page underscore two underscore limit underscore 10. It ensures that the response for each request variation is stored separately. Redis client dot get cache key checks if the response is already cached. If it's a cache hit, the response is returned immediately. And if it's a cache miss, meaning if the data isn't found in Redis, the database is queried using fetch users from database page comma limit. And once the data is retrieved, it is stored in Redis with a TTL of 600 seconds or 10 minutes. This ensures the stale data is automatically removed. Request level caching is ideal for read heavy APIs. These are the APIs with frequent GET requests and relatively static data. And endpoints that involve relatively complex computations for large database queries. For example, responses with parameters like page or limit. Now, what if the client only needs data that has changed since their last request? Conditional caching is a technique that ensures clients receive updated data only when necessary, minimizing redundant data transfers. 
It's an efficient way to reduce bandwidth usage and improve API responsiveness by leveraging HTTP headers like eTag and LastModified. eTag is a unique identifier for resource version, and LastModified is the timestamp of the last update to a resource. Let's see how this works. Here, the server first calculates an eTag for the resource using the hash of its data. The current eTag acts as a unique identifier for the specific version of the user data. On subsequent request, the client sends the eTag in the if none match header. The server compares the client if none match value with the current eTag, and if they match, it means the data hasn't changed. The server responds with a 304 not modified status and no response body saving bandwidth. If the eTag doesn't match or isn't provided, the server returns the full resource and the new eTag. The client then stores the new eTag for future request. And here is a sample client-server interaction. In the first request, there is no eTag sent by the client, and the server responds with a 200 OK and a response body. In the subsequent request, client sends an eTag, and the server checks for the eTag. If unchanged, it sends the response at 304 not modified. And if it is changed, it sends a response with 200 OK and headers with new eTag and updated data in the body. This showcases how eTag-based conditional caching minimizes unnecessary data transfer and ensures clients always get the latest data when needed. By leveraging eTag and last modified headers, it ensures faster responses, lower bandwidth usage, and an overall better user experience in REST APIs. Now, as we have learned, caching is powerful but stale or outdated data can lead to inconsistencies. So to ensure users get accurate data, we need strategies for cache invalidation. That is the methods to update or remove cache data when the underlying sources changes. Let's explore three common approaches with detailed examples, including the use of Redis. In the write-through strategy, the cache is updated synchronously whenever the database is updated. This ensures that the cache always holds the latest data. So here, the application writes the data to both the database and the cache at the same time. The cache stays in sync with the database. So reads can be served directly from the cache. The main benefit of this approach is that it ensures the cache is always up to date. It's simple to implement for read heavy systems, but it's slightly slow to write due to synchronous nature of cache updates. And so every database triggers a cache update. In the write behind strategy, the cache is updated asynchronously after the database is updated the database remains the source of truth, and the cache update happens in the background. As you can see in the code, here the application writes to the database first, and then a background process, for example, a queue or thread, updates the cache after the write is complete. And so, it has faster writes since cache updates are deferred and suitable for high write throughput systems. But again, cache might temporarily hold stale data until the update is complete. And it is also more complex to implement due to the asynchronous handling. And finally, we have TTL-based eviction. In this approach, cache data is automatically expired after a set time to live or TTL. Once expired, the cache either fetches fresh data from the database or deletes the entry. So here, data is returned to the cache with a TTL value, and when the TTL expires, the cache entry is removed or refreshed. For example, here is how TTL-based eviction works in Redis. Here, the data expires in 5 minutes, ensuring it doesn't linger longer than it should. Now, the choice of invalidation strategy depends on your system requirements. A write-through strategy is best for read-heavy workloads where cache accuracy is critical, but it has slow writes. A write-behind is for write-heavy workloads where cache freshness can tolerate deletes. But again, there is a temporary cache staleness. And TTL base is data with predictable or time-sensitive expiration. For example, product prices or session tokens, but it still has potential for stale data within the TTL. Cache invalidation ensures that your cache data stays fresh and accurate, avoiding stale responses that can frustrate your users. By carefully choosing the right strategy, right through, right behind, or TTL-based eviction, you can balance performance and consistency to meet the needs of your application. Caching becomes truly powerful when implemented across multiple layers of the system each designed to handle specific types of data closer to the user. This approach optimizes performance, minimizes server load, and delivers faster responses. Let's break this down step by step with an example. So imagine a user is requesting a product image on an e-commerce website. 
The journey of this request involves multiple layers of caching. When the user's browser first loads the image, it stores it in the cache. If the user revisits the page or navigates back, the browser retrieves the image locally without even contacting the user. This is the fastest layer of caching and ensures instant access for repeated requests. If the browser cache doesn't have the image, the request is forwarded to a CDN or Content Delivery Network. A CDN is a network of servers distributed globally, designed to cache and serve content like images, videos, and static files. For example, if the user is in London, the image might be served from a CDN server in the UK rather than the origin server, reducing latency and server load. And if neither the browser nor the CDN has the image, the request reaches to your application's API server. Here, an application layer cache like Redis or Memcache stores the metadata or frequently accessed data about the image. For instance, the API server could cache metadata like image URL, resolution, or compression format. This reduces the need of repetitive database queries, ensuring the backend remains efficient. And finally, if the cache misses at all layers, the server fetches the image metadata from the database. This is the last resort and typically the slowest step. Once the data is retrieved, it's passed through the layers, updating the caches for future requests. Guys, I have also explored CDNs and application layer caching in detail in my previous videos. These topics are part of comprehensive playlists, which you can find in the playlist linked in my description. So bringing it all together with the techniques we have explored so far, you use in-memory caching for frequently accessed data. You implement request level caching for predictable get responses. We can leverage conditional caching for up-to-date bandwidth efficient interactions. Ensure consistency with robust cache invalidation strategies. And combine all layers such as browsers, CDN and application for the ultimate performance. With this blueprint, you can design REST APIs that are not only fast, but also scalable and production ready.